How are you? Yeah, who are you getting over? We live? We are live. Or is it Memorix? We are live. Welcome to the first episode of the EOD docuseries. The um, very first. The very first. That's amazing. Numero uno. I'm Bobby Stegall, and today I'm joined with retired Lieutenant Colonel Jay, Jay Land. Land. I'm Jay Land, and you're not. <laughs> I'm Bobby Stegall. <laughs> so we're here in, uh, in Chattanooga. And I want to say, uh, first off, thank you very much for doing this. Um, there's been a lot of people who were excited about making this docuseries. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that we're live streaming adequately on Facebook. Cool. And I'll let you uh, introduce yourself and kind of uh, your military background. Um, you know, first, I just want to say thanks for doing this. This is important thanks, on many levels. Um, you know, a way to highlight uh, the men and women of, of a community that is not... Uh, not often recognized, and many of us like that. A lot of people like keeping it low. Uh, but more importantly, you know, showing an opportunity where uh, fellow techs uh, can perhaps find a way after they uh, hang up the uh, EOD crimpers and move on to life after the military, uh, a way to see that there is a world of possibility out there uh, and that there is a huge community. You mentioned it earlier. There's a huge community of people. You know, we've seen such an uptick in, in uh, uh, veteran suicides, and we know how bad it's affecting the EOD community. Uh, you know, it's things like this that help them under help everyone understand that there's a huge community of fellow techs, fellow service members uh, from all branches that you know are there to help. Yeah. and are there to take care of each other. And that's what, I th that's what we do best, I feel like. I mean, if my experience over the past month has, has anything to show for it, I mean, I've had, uh, I was literally on my way to Miami with uh, no place to stay yet, and I got on the plane, asked my EOD brethren, you know, hey, does anybody have a place I can stay in Miami? And two hours later when I landed, I had three different places. And it's just amazing the uh, how small the community is, but also how how powerful we can be. It's an amazing community, it really yep. is. So looking back on your your military career, let's start with uh, how you entered EOD. Um, I first enlisted. I was wanting to get some college money. Uh, the folks couldn't afford to send me to college. Uh, I did my first year. Uh, you know, raised my hand at the recruiter. Uh, that ended up becoming an ROTC scholarship to the University of Southern Mississippi. And, um, you know, I was coming down to the point where you had to choose a branch or apply for a branch, and I really did not know what I wanted to do. No. Um, I had been a, uh, what they call a SOPC, Special Operations Preparations Candidate. Uh, I haven't heard of that before. Yeah, it, it's an old program. It, I don't think it's around anymore, but basically you're attached to an, to an A-team. And uh, you're you're the nug, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you go make a parachute jump. Guess who's shaking all the chutes? And but gotcha. you know, I after about my third or fourth 26 mile road march with a 80 pound ruck, I figured out what I didn't want to do. <laughs> so I was really kind of wondering what I was going to do. And one of my instructors, Captain Tom Henu, uh, he's like, "Man, you you need to go be a, an EOD guy." And I'm like, "What EOD? Well, that's EOD, right? What, what you know?" Every other day, what, what we, <laughs> end of day. Yeah, he's like, no dummy. He's like, these guys, they they go around, they blow stuff up, drink beer, and play volleyball all day. <laughs> I'm like, damn, that's a good way to put this economics degree to work. All right. Um, <laughs> so I was blessed enough to, to actually, you know, be selected. You know, then you had to be a, an ammunition officer. Uh, within the Warden's Force. So I was luckily enough selected to be uh, an ammo uh, lieutenant. Then, um, you know, I got the, the one EOD school slot they offered. So uh, I found my way down to uh, Eglin Air Force Base and started phase one, which was then at uh, Eglin's was uh, 94. So it was right in the, mo in, in the middle of the move from Eglin to Indian Head. So okay. we did the first phase there at Eglin. Uh, packed up, moved to Indian Head, 
and um, you know that's a whole different world. It you know we, we started with uh, I think uh, NBC, then demo, then tools and methods, then recon. That's almost okay in that order. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of backwards to to yeah, what the preliminary yeah, course was for yeah. me. And then you 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 bump up to uh, Indian Head, and that's where you get into ground, air, uh, IEDs, uh, and nukes. Okay. So, um, yeah, it it turned out to be um, you know very challenging school. Obviously, I you know as anybody can tell you. Um, what year is this? This was ninety four. I'm a dinosaur <laughs> man. You know, back when I was a lieutenant, we used to tease everybody. You know, hey, you know, the first thing you learn was dip flaming arrow in a bucket of water. And, uh, you know, now I'm one of those guys that, you know, they're asking me about Civil War cannonballs and all that good stuff. Right. You know, because I'm old, they say. <laughs> uh, but it, it was a good time, man. So Wait, I'm, you age well. I, I try. It's all yeah. this clean living. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, the, the the food that we had today was actually pretty clean. We'll, we'll get more into the, your passions um, later. And so you, you started off in EOD in 1994. Yeah. Um, and so what was your first duty station after? Uh, Fort Bragg, you, Fort, man. Okay. Well, so, you, you sound so excited when you say it. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I'd been to Bragg a couple of times, had buddies in the Army. Uh, but, you know, Bragg just has a special place. And, and back then, we didn't have the battalions there. Right. It was just 18th EOD out on Chicken Road, uh, all by ourselves and unafraid. And just just so uh, people know, like the EOD units um, back in the day, they were they were much smaller. They're about what forty five man companies uh, now. Were, yeah, yeah, probably and, that. And now there there used to be like uh, twenty person debts. There you go. Fifteen person debts. So, you know, we were all by ourselves. The battalion was there at, at Fort Gillum, and uh, my poor battalion commander, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Miguel Perez. Uh, <laughs> I put a lot of gray hairs on that man's head. <laughs> Um, but you know, for me, it was just a uh, just a, a, a great time to be an EOD officer. It's a great time to be alive. Uh, Fort Bragg always kept you busy. Yeah, uh, we ran incidents from sun up to sundown some days, and um, man, it, it was just it was good. Okay, um, a lot of old school at that time. Um, just some great uh, great EOD techs I got to work with, and um, and it, it was a good time to be an EOD lieutenant. And having uh, no prior military uh, officer training, I guess, other than your uh, you know basic leadership courses, um, how was it? How did you see, see yourself different um, as an EOD officer versus somebody who was like an artillery officer? I, I had no idea. You had no idea. You know, I was there. I was the XO, and uh, you know, I started getting property accountability shoved down my throat, and maintenance, and all the things that. You know, that make a, a company run smoothly. You know, yep. the commander has his fingers in a lot of pieces of pie, but he really counts on that XO to make sure that, uh, you know, the exercises are planned, uh, the, the equipment and the vehicles are maintained, and that there's some property accountability there. Okay. Um, so it, for me, it was, it was just every day was a new learning experience. And, uh, you know, going in and then getting to, you know, getting to actually go run incidents. And right, learning. which is very rare uh, for, I mean, sorry to cut you off, but like whenever I was in uh, infantry, it seemed like the infantry officers were definitely more um, paperwork almost oriented. The first, you know, good bit while they're there trying to learn the units, learn the NCOs, learn who ran what, what made what work, and then they're really hands-on. But it sounds to me like in EOD, they were just kind of like, congratulations, Well, here you go. I was always real aggressive, and, uh, the, you know, the way I figured it, I, I didn't go through, you know, 10 months of EOD school to <laughs> sit behind a desk. Right. And, um, you know, one of my biggest NCO mentors, a guy named Rusty Harker, um, Rusty took me under his wing and really taught me, you know, how to, to both be an EOD tech um, but also be, be a leader, hmm. uh, you know, NCOs like Steve Burns and Mark Hawkins and and just some of the some of the guys there that really took an interest, you know, uh, in making sure the lieutenant was <laughs> trained right. And and you know I took that off I, I took that over into my officer years. You know, especially the older I got, you know, when I'd get a, a new lieutenant into my battalion, you know, I would find out 
you know, hey, bring the lieutenant and the platoon sergeant <laughs> up. Uh, yeah. You know, and I would tell them in front of the company commander and the first sergeant, hey, lieutenant, that E-7 right there, you better listen to him or her. Right. You know, I know you're the lieutenant, and I know you're in charge by God, but, you know, that E-7 has been honing his craft or her craft for, you know, 10, 12, 15 years, so there's a lot of wisdom there. Yeah. And then I would also tell the, the, the E-7, hey, Sergeant, you, this is your lieutenant. You know, you guys are in this together. Yeah. Uh, and it's prepping them. It was pre- prepping my platoon leaders uh, and my platoon sergeants to be company commanders and first sergeants. Because so was, was it almost like teaching them at a young age how to, how to bridge that NCO officer yeah. gap? Yeah. Okay. Uh, because people like Rusty Harker and Nick Magnum and Randy Sipes and a whole host of them did the same for me. Right. And Sergeant Harker, he'd pull me out behind the building and box my ears when I needed it. <laughs> and, you know, there were t- there's a lot of stories. Well, um, uh, hold on. G- go in on that. Like, uh, pulled you outside of the system, so to say, so that no one else saw it. No, is, we, that, is that strange? Hey, LT, let's go out back and talk. Wow. Yeah. Well, that, and, that says a lot about a leader. Oh, he was an outstanding uh, NCO. Okay. Um, and I took a lot away from that. So, you know, I, I think if anything's missing now in the Army, we've produced NCOs. Uh, senior NCOs so quickly, um, you know, they haven't had time to get their licks in and figure out how to, to be that NCO leader like some of the ones I grew up with. Yeah. But, you know, when you're fighting a war for 20 years, you know, you're you're pushing people through as quick as you can because, you know, you got to have it done. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the, the needs of the Army, literally, right? Yeah. I'm good. All right, so you I always uh, keep an extra. Rusty taught me that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Two, two is one, and uh, one is none, as they say. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to drop in the, uh, the comments on my personal uh, Facebook live stream. Uh, I know that we're uh, across several pages right now. Um, and also check out my Patreon. Uh, so to fund this whole thing, we're going to be doing um, uh, $5 subscriptions uh, throughout the next 15 months. And uh, I guess that's the admin bit of that. So is your cigar up and running again? It's running. All right, here we go. So now we have uh, 1994. I'm guessing you're there till 97, 98. 90, yeah, left 98. I got out in 98 to become a. Uh, I heard the siren song of making a lot of money and, <laughs> and um, ended up becoming an investment rep at uh, First Union, now Wells Fargo. I did a couple other things, you know, chasing the dollar. But I was really young, you know. I, I didn't understand uh, the value of the army, uh, the effect that being on that team in that team atmosphere really had on me. Hmm. Uh, So I got out and became a a banker for for a couple of years, a few years, and I just, I didn't like it. And um, and I was was looking to get in, get back, you know, I maintained my reserve commission. Okay. Um, But then I, you know. Well, what's that mean for people who don't know? What's, uh, to retain your reserve commission, what's that mean? Well, I kept my commission and and, uh, I was a drilling reservist. Okay. Um, wasn't doing EOD. Uh, I was doing uh, some other work with uh, the basically the draft board. The draft board is ran uh, by a group of reservists that ensure that there are enough people that have registered and everybody knows what's going on. So that was really exciting. It saw me, taught me a lot at a, a few upper echelons about how we make our government run on a few things. Huh. Um, so you gained some experience even yeah. while you're outside the quote unquote. Outside the system. system, yeah. Yeah, and you can do that no matter where you're at. You're always going to learn. You're either learning what to do or what not to do. Or um, that, <clears throat> you know. Yeah. And some, you know, sometimes, you know, it took me a while, what, you know, how to figure out what not to do. <laughs> um, but I was working to get back in, and all of a sudden, uh, September 11th happened, and all of a sudden things moved quick. You know, I was back in before I knew it. I ended up at uh, the Army Material Command as uh, a watch officer in the 24-hour watch. Wow. You know, the Army Material Command sl- supplies all the uh, material supplies, equipment, uh, from bullets to MREs to tanks to helicopters, anything you need. I was about need. to say, it sounds like uh, everything that we need in the field. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's huge. Um, so you weren't actually on active duty when 9-11 um, we were hit. I was 9/11. coming back on, and then, then it hit. And Where were you at? I was still at Bragg. Still at Bragg? Yeah. So, um, what went through your mind? It's like, damn, I wish, you know, I I wish I were saddled up right now. It's time to go. Yeah. 
Um, but it, it didn't take long. Uh, but they, they only sent me to D.C. Uh, so I, I got there to Army Material Command as a watch officer uh, within several months. Uh, I was uh, command briefer. So every morning I prepped the, the briefing for uh, General Kern, our four-star, our DCG, and we, I organized and ran the operation of the briefing. Uh, then the chief of operations retired, so they made me the chief of operations as the captain. <laughs> and I was in way over my head. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like a like a maybe one star or at least no, an LTC. No, no, it's a, a, an 05 billet, 04, senior okay. 04, 05 billet. Um, but, you know, the colonel thought I could handle it, and he threw me into it. Uh, and then I got pulled up to be the XO to, uh, to the G3, okay. um, our two-star operations guy, a guy named General Mitch Stevenson. Uh, General Stevenson wrapped up his term a few years ago as is the DAG four, but now G G three that's logistics, correct? No, operations. O- operations, okay. Yeah. G four is logistics. Okay. So General Stevenson was running the operation, um, and uh, so pulled me up to be his XO for several months, uh, and then uh, I came down with orders to go to Fort Campbell. Yep. Uh, as part of the hundred screaming eagles. Yep. And then uh, about two weeks before I was supposed to to leave. Uh, they switched me over to Fort Bragg. Uh, uh, I'm sure that was good, easy on your family. Um, yeah, you know, we, we just moved right back down the road. Okay. Um, I had a, a buddy named Bill Downer. Bill and I went through EOD school together. He was there at uh, at the COSCOM. He was the uh, the COSCOM ammo officer, so he ran all things Class Five. <laughs> and um, so when you know, they're going through the process of trying to pull people in. Right. Uh, you know, Bill was moving on, and Bill saw my name on the list, and Bill circled my name, and thanks, Bill Downer, I went to, right back to Fort Bragg. So, <laughs> uh, but it turned out to be a, you know, a great job. I, I, I did that. I deployed uh, with First Coscom, then ended up being attached to Second Marine for six months in Tecotum. Okay, where's... where's uh... Cottom is uh, on the west side of uh, Baghdad. We're right across the lake from Fallujah and Ramadi. And so we're looking, we're looking at what, 2003, 2004 time frame? 2004, 2005, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I found myself, you know, the first six months in Balad, uh, making sure we had enough ammunition within theater, Uh, you know, controlling the flow and and pushing stuff when we needed it. Now, is this at any capacity of EOD, or this is mostly just uh, higher? This was straight... uh, you know, ammunition officer at a, at a core level, um, making sure that, uh, you know, the, was it, MN, back then it was MNCI, Multinational Corps Iraq, making sure that all U.S. forces had ammunition. It was a strategic billet, making sure that all the operational level uh, assets had the munitions they needed. Because uh, they don't just magically appear. You, they don't. You, yeah, I know. It's well, amazing. I was playing Call of Duty the other day, and I just asked for ammo. Yeah, ammo would fall well. Okay. You know, it, it, it goes back. we got a supply chain that reaches back to all the depots uh, and oh. some of the civilian organizations across the country. Yeah, I was going to say, like in Oklahoma, there's a, yeah. a McAllister, you know, yeah. ammo depot. Yeah. And so in 2004, 2005, that's one of the big, bigger pushes for Fallujah. Of course, yeah. And so you're you're looking at <clears throat> you're looking at ammo as a, a critical asset for lives almost at that. Well, not almost. You are yeah. Like the if you don't have ammo, there's going to be lives lost. And so what, how would you deal with that stress, knowing that it was on paper what you were doing, but you were making things materialize to save lives? Like what well, kind of stress stress level was that? There's a lot that? of Mountain Dew and cigars and <laughs> sixteen hour days. You know, we oh had a, gosh, we had man. problems with. Uh, with the flares that they kick out of the back of the aircraft, um, there was just a lot of issues, and we we were going dangerous red into black. So we would coordinate shipments of flares uh, from um, from the Conus. Now, why would you now why would you use flares? Why why that? Why well, aircraft that? use flares for any variety of reasons. Okay. So you know you see the aircraft. You've seen that picture of the. Uh, the C-17 coming in, there's all the little bright specks of yeah, those. Right. Okay. So there's any number of reasons aircraft will use flares. Okay, to light up the battlefield one. Yeah, you know, maybe trying to get, you know, trying to fool a, a SAM or something like that. There's just a, a number of reasons. Okay. But we needed them. Right. Um, so therefore, 
several weeks we were shipping them straight from the depot um, oh, to one of the Air Force bases, putting them on the plane at the Air Force base, and flying them straight into Balot. Wow. So, you know, a flash to bang of, no pun intended, you know, six or seven days, whereas normally everything comes in by boat. Right. You've got things programmed weeks and months ahead, uh, but once you hit a red or a black area uh, situation, you, you got to get that stuff in there. You just can't wait. Hmm. Um, so I lived that life for a bit, and then my boss called me in right after R&R and said that they were attaching me to 2nd Marine. Uh, one of the one of the general officers there had been talking to our general officer and said he'd feel a lot better if he had an Army guy because, you know, it was the Marine Corps region, but there's a lot of, you know, Army things going on. So mm-hmm. they wanted somebody that could interface. Okay. So, you know, I go from the comfiness of Balad where, uh, you know, every Sunday was a couple hours at the pool and, uh, you know, it was nice digs and right. you had all kind of, you, you had Charlie's and Burger King and Pizza Hut and all that. Oh, Charlie's. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. So right. then, you know, the next day I'm in Tacatum with... Oh, we're frozen. So, you know, we're there in Tacatum, um with uh, the 2nd Marine and uh, starting to learn my way around Fallujah and Ramadi, it hit Haditha, Rawa. Um, so that really kind of made me understand just how big, uh, how big of a picture was really going on. It wasn't just a, uh, a screen in the Ops Center in, uh, at Fort Belvoir AMC or, or a screen there in Belide. I'm tearing up the microphone here. Uh, sorry for the uh, camera freeze there. Hope you guys enjoyed the our faces, however they were frozen. So now we're in um, end of two thousand five. Yeah, I uh, I come back to Fort Bragg and uh, I get the phone call that uh, I would be the next secretary of the general staff, the SGS for uh, the COSCOM commander. Uh, so leave my cush- my cushy munition officer billet. Move up to the headquarters. I'm, uh, I find myself as the SGS at the first COSCOM. You know the interface uh, between the, the lower staffs, uh, the the boss's staff, and making sure that everything that came to the chief of staff, the DCG or the boss was spot on correct. Make sure ac- actions are synchronized, OERs are up on time. Uh, you know the right briefings are done at the right place. Okay. Um, so I did that for a few months. Sounds pretty stressful. Yeah, it's it's not a fun job. Yeah. Uh, and then the boss comes in and announces I'm going to be his XO. So uh, become the XO to the to the Coscom CG. Uh, did that. So I guess that finished out a year. Uh, and then found myself as the uh, Brigade S3 for the 507th uh, being sent over for the surge. Hmm. So, um, this is 07, right? Yeah, yeah, you do math really well. Uh, I, yeah, I, uh, I, I remember, uh, yeah, I was in college during all that, and I remember, uh, a lot of my friends going over there. So. Yeah, so I spent, uh, you know, back out to western Iraq. We were in Al Assad, so we had uh, a battalion out of the 504th, first of the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment one of our own organic battalions that we took with us and a third battalion that had come in. So we had three battalions and about 1,700 people that were running the streets of Western Iraq. Um, it was good, though. I mean, I, I got out about once a week, ran one of the gun truck missions, you know, just trying to understand what people did. Um, you know, I was out a lot with the Marines. Did you have to do that? Didn't have to, but I figure if I'm the guy that's signing orders, putting a kid on the road, uh, if you know, it came down to me and, and the brigade commander that were responsible for publishing orders. Uh, and if I'm putting an order on the street that I've written that puts your kid on the road, um, I, I want to, to understand what's going on and, and understand what's happening so that I'm better at my job. So a uh, lot of time out on the road. Hmm. Uh, Good on you for that. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I had some great leaders along the way that, that did the exact same thing, you know. So yep. um, I'm just doing things that a lot of other leaders did. Um, 
yeah, it was, it was a great time. Uh, came back from that, found myself as a battalion XO. Uh, that was worse than any other job I'd had. Um, we had our our battalion. Uh, we were we were there at Bragg, and two other battalions had deployed out of Bragg, so we pulled in their companies. So, <laughs> yeah, ended up with sounds like a yeah, like eight companies, three detachments, and a couple of teams. Wow. So roughly fifteen hundred people. So that that was a year that really sucked. Yeah, you know. See that? Then I I got handed uh, the big D the divorce. Mm. You know, EOD, everyone's divorced. Uh, yep. So, so there I went. You know that that process got started, and uh, you know suffered through that. But I learned so much. You know, uh, time management. When you got that many people, you're responsible for. Um, and the battalion commander, she was she was very demanding. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, failure wasn't really an option. Good. Uh, I, I screwed up a lot of things, but I made it through. Uh, then got picked for the Naval War College and ended up in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, spent 15 months months in uh, Newport. I did their version of the SAM School of Advanced Military Studies. Okay. Uh, it's the Maritime Advanced Warfighter School. Uh, wow. It's an it's an operational level school where they rip your cranium open and shove in all kinds <laughs> of you know operational stuff where you're you're living and reworking. Um, you know, former campaigns where you're really learning the art of operational planning. Can you can you give me an example of what we studied? Uh, yeah, of what you say. Like I know that um, from watching um, Band of Brothers, obviously, um, what um, Captain Winters did on D Day is still studied today at West Point. Yeah, that's exactly. You know, I, I think it was D Day that we took one of the one of the operations focused on D Day. Uh, another one on, uh, I think it was I Drang in Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken, and then a um, uh, couple of battles out of the Civil War. Wow. So, you know, you spend weeks going through every nook and cranny, every nut and bolt of, of all the plans, of all the history, and then you go through and, and you learn the operational art by uh, basically undoing what they did and redoing it so that you are taking the time to learn and understand why decisions are made um, in a very intense method. So are, are we talking about the, the, the way that you plan and operate uh, or create an operation broken down to the team leader and how he decides to do things? No, this, this is all operational. You know, in, in the military, you know, you have tactical. That's your company level. Right. 18th, you know, 18th EOD is going to occupy area, you know, alpha, and they will provide EOD support to X, Y, and Z areas and X, Y, and Z battalions, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Then you step it up to the operational level, you know, above division, because the division level is still very tactical. And in many ways, a core is still tactical, but you move it up to the division level where you are studying at the division and above level on how you're bringing forces to bear within uh, a certain uh, operational problem. Okay, so literally operational like context. Operation Overland or Overlord, yeah. so yeah. That, that all the details that go into that. Yeah, gotcha. so you know, you're reading, um, they cram a lot in, you're reading probably a book a day, book every two days, Good grief. something having to do with operational art. Uh, Did you read be, the Art of War? Yeah, I've I've got it right here, you know, marked up. Uh, <laughs> but you know, you're 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 learning how to process information, uh, divine the commander's intent. What is the boss looking to do? Okay. What do we need to do that? What resources do we need? What actions must we take? And how do we fold that together into one overarching plan? that will bring in all the elements, all the war fighting functions, uh, whether it be logistics, um, maneuver and support. Supply uh, chain. Yeah. Yeah, so how do you pull all that together and synchronize it so that you can go back to the boss and go, look, sir, look, ma'am, you want to do A, B, and C. This is your stated objective. This is the guidance that you've given us. Here's our initial plan on how we do it, and then you continually refine that plan. So, uh, you know, the Army created 
uh, the it's called SAMS, the School of Advanced Military Studies. Uh, they created it coming out of uh, uh, in in the early 80s. They started putting it together so that when officers would go through CGSC or any of the other intermediate level educations, uh, they could be picked to go to this school. Uh, you go through the program very intense, um, and then you they spit you out and send you out to a division or core mm -hmm. where you are the planner. You are the CG's well, bubba. So you have a team of little, you know, they call uh, sometimes they call them Jedi's. You got a team of Jedi's, <laughs> like, um, and and you are the the commander's plan. You, okay. You you sit, you spend time with the commander and the G three, the J three, whatever three. Uh, and you develop what the boss wants uh, to execute. And so we're talking about three corps for the three corps, I'm sure. Yeah, for three corps. Yeah. So I was almost checking IDs there one time. That's how close I got to being at operational level. <laughs> but uh, exciting times. Yeah, exciting times. I, I had to, I had to the, input the, my uh, experience the, in operational the, level. The great place, man. The great place. The great, the great place. Welcome to Fort Hood. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, it's uh. It was a great time at the War College, um, but then um, ended up going back to Iraq, back to Fort Bragg with 18th Airborne Corps mm -hmm. um, as the uh, Chief of Supply Services, Maintenance, and something else. Ended up deploying over back over to uh, Victory Base, um, and I had already, I was, I was supposed to go somewhere else, but again, assignments changed, but I'd already been signed up for the Defense uh, Strategist course at the Army War College. so. <laughs> You know, for the first three months, four months of my last deployment, I was waking up at about five in the morning and going to school for two or three hours a day, and then into my day job. Right. And then um, ended up spending the last three months jumping back and forth between Embassy Baghdad, where I worked with uh, the embassy staff in planning the transition from a uh, military Department of Defense supply chain uh, to the uh, State Department plan supply chain. Okay, so what, what's the the separation there between State Department and military? Just well, so for every every drop of gas that we needed uh, in Iraq was brought from somewhere, uh, usually Kuwait or Turkey. Mm -hmm. We would pull fuel from the Baji refinery from during certain circumstances. Um, but we would put about a million gallons of fuel on the road every day Whoa. and truck them into country, and then they would be subdivided at, at one of the logistics hubs and moved out to a fob near you where they filled <laughs> out you. You know, the, the large fuel blivets. Uh, so you know, we're running 12 days of fuel. I could forecast down the road where we're going to be 12 days, so I had to have my numbers right today to have fuel on the ground in 12 days to fill that bladder before it goes red. And if that bladder goes red, then we have troops out in... We got no gas. No gas, so no so, transport, so no... Yeah. Now, this, the State Department, um, <laughs> you know, if you go to any major embassy, uh, let's say Embassy Mexico, I've spent time in Mexico working with those dudes, uh, they, they have a fuel card, they go to the local Panamax, they swipe the card and they gas up the vehicle that's their logistics, you know, their fuel logistics train. They are not, you know, the State Department is not designed to plan to bring a million gallons of fuel into a theater a day. And then you have to look at food. How are you getting your food in? Right. You know, how do you manage that contract so that, you know, in 10 days you're going to have approximately 12,000 mouths you got to feed at this one DFAC. Well, if you don't have food there, they got Oof. nothing. Yeah. So it's it's constant planning at ten to twelve days out, making sure that stuff's coming in. Is there a reason why it's ten to twelve days? Is just the yeah. number that ends up working well? well, you got, well it, or? it builds you it builds you a cushion. Okay. So if you can keep the pipeline full for ten days, if something happens on day seven, you have some fudge factor. You, fudge. you have is that what they call it? The fudge factor. Yeah, you have time to to wiggle out and fix it. But you're con I mean you're looking at this every day. So every day you're refining what you need, where you need it. Uh, so that you can get the orders placed in time because the supplier has to have time uh, to get that, you know, Absolutely. to get the food to Kuwait so that you can get it from Kuwait to, to Kodam, you know, special yeah, like Thanksgiving. 
You know, yeah. Thanksgiving was a huge thing. You know, we had to have turkeys on the ground by like. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I saw a guy get fired um, because oh. he he dropped the ball. You know that wow. you you just don't mess with a, a soldier's Thanksgiving. You don't, yeah. So you know you got a turkey on the ground. You got to have X amount of turkeys on the ground by one November, so that you can push to get them to the local defect by fifteen November. So they have time to prep. So they have one time to prep, but also uh, because you need that wiggle room. Okay. You, know, you, you can't just wait. Because if it's supposed to be there on Thanksgiving Day, then well, there's no gotta, there's no wiggle room in case something happens. Yeah, well, you got to have the you start prepping Thanksgiving two or three days out. Yep. So if you got no turkey, you can't prep. Yep. You know, if you got no candy gems, you can't prep. And Joe candy gets gems. pissed off when he's got no candy gems and turkey on Thanksgiving. Yep. And so, makes him miss home more, I think. Yeah, and that, I mean that's one of the big highlight meals, uh, you know. During my career, one of the my favorite things to do uh, was always serving in the line on Thanksgiving. I just hmm. enjoyed that. That's the most fun. Yeah. Um, do you know how many holidays you spent away from home? I quit counting, dude. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, but then after that, I um, you know I was beating down the door to get back into the community. Uh, you know, the EOD community, in case yeah. anybody just tuned in. You know, some of the assignments, you know, when you get pulled up to be the XO to a two-star in the log field, once they got their claws in you, you know. I mean, I can see where you're you're trained now, and yeah, you're, you're good at your job. It's going to be hard start, to let you go. They're starting to manage you by name. Yep. You know, this guy, oh, this guy was General So-and-So's XO. Oh, I want him to come do that. So, you know, they keep kept pulling me away. But finally, right. um, you know, finally Branch was merciful on me and sent me, I won't say merciful, uh, sent me to the twentieth, and um, you know I I knew a bit about the twentieth. General Snow and I had known each other a, a little bit. Uh, we had worked together a little bit in in Baghdad. He was the commander, or had been the commander, one of the first commanders. Uh, and I took one of the WMD coordination teams. So it, it was a great thing for me. I'm back in the field. I'm back with EOD. You know, EOD officers, EOD NCOs, where I'm back to doing what I really love to do, but, you know, the cruelty of the Army kept me away from it for a while. <laughs> um, so what year are you, are you at now? 2013, probably, I'm assuming? That sounds about 2012. 2012? Okay. Yeah, I came back, from, uh, came back from Iraq the last time, knocked out jump master school. It had been something I'd been wanting. I had all the jumps I needed. Uh, I just needed to get my jump master school completed and then get my, you know, get my yes, exits. Sir. Yeah. Uh, so I can, you know, get my, my AJ and PJ duties in and get my senior wings. That's awesome. So uh, jump master school was, was painful but worth it. And then I just started jumping like a fool, <laughs> you know, trying to chase down a master badge. But um, Did you ever get the master badge? No, nah, I ended up with senior only. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied it wasn't just a plain old ice cream cone. I, I got my little star to go on top. I didn't even get the ice cream cone. So yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Um, so ended up up at uh, the 20th, took one of the WMD teams, had a great time. You know, I was sporting Central South America. So what 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 is the, the duties of a WMD team? And and obviously you have to be careful probably what you say. No, but. it's it we it's a coordination team that goes in and and works at the uh, at the uh, high tactical, low operational area to advise the commanders on what can be done, what should be done basically a plus up in some ways so that now that commander at whatever level can look over and he's got a team of guys and gals uh, I think it's 15 17 people EOD techs chemical FA-52 the nuke weapon dudes uh, uh, our own combo team and our own counter or intel team that can take everything that's coming in uh, having to do with EOD WMD pull it together and advise the commander on what should be done, what needs to be done, what are the resources we need to have so that he or she can execute their plan. So let's would this have to have to do with anything like say there's a a WMD that goes that's uh needs to be diffused or is a, a threat to going off or what have you. Would this be the team that goes and does that? Like no, what's what's No, no, no. We're we we're like the what is that new advise and assist brigade. Okay. Uh, we're the guys on the ground that are the commanders, you know, 
smart guys. Okay. This they, is what you do. This is what you don't do. Yeah. So that as they're planning, mm-hmm. they understand what's going on. We're okay. a force multiplier. Um, you know, kind of little little bit little teams that go out and uh, can also be in the, inter- the interface between the 20th and, and, a, and, and local leadership. Hmm. Uh, it's really just giving the commander an understanding of, of what's going on, uh, what they're facing, what this means. Um, so, you know, you really learn a lot about planning and operating within the WMD, counter WMD environment. Uh, so that when the commander does have questions, uh, the commander has certain things that he wants to try and do within his space. Uh, you can help them achieve that, and they are not interfering with the guys and gals that are running the routes. And I mean, I'm just going to say it. That is sounds like, to me, uh, one of the more high-stressful jobs in the military being, being – no? You don't it's, think so? It's boring, man. All it's boring? Doing, all you're doing is reading plans and planning. <laughs> but you're planning for uh, around, around the idea of WMDs. <laughs> You're just a bunch of subject matter experts on WMDs. Okay, all right. To to most people, it, it that's kind of like a oh okay. So I mean, you know, Billy down the the road, you know, he works at Arby's. He plans around the the roast beef, you know, and you guys are over here planning around the WMDs. So I yeah, just think it's, it's it's fascinating. There's a lot of people out there, a lot smarter than me, but you know, um, yeah, it, it was a it was a cool gig, and you know, one of the things we're doing for, uh, um. Uh, Northcom, Northcom, the command, uh, was one of my habitual relationships. The Mexican Army requested some training assistance uh, to start developing counter IED capabilities. Wow! Uh, you know the drug because cart- the drug okay. yeah the drug cartels are horrible, man. They you know they're down there thumping people. Yeah, no, and, that's no joke. And during this time, uh, they were bombing a lot of Panamex pipelines. Panamex. Uh, is is the company, the government-owned subsidiary that runs the fuel within the country of Mexico. Okay. And that, that probably comes down from uh, South America, correct? I don't know where That's they get lines. it. Um, but the, uh, the the cartels, what they would do, probably what they're still doing, I don't know, uh, they'll go bang a, blow up a pipeline, either to A, shut it off and cause the government headaches, or to B, steal the fuel, and then they go black market and sell it. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I was able to work with Northcom, uh, work with the Mexican government, and we went down and set up counter IED courses. Uh, I had an NCO, uh, just a brilliant NCO, Master Sergeant, my team NCO, I see, that knew IEDs. And so we went to Radio Shack and spent about $10,000 and bought <laughs> a bunch of components and Home Depot and bought a bunch of stuff. And we sat in our building, and we made uh, inert IEDs yep. that would ring off when you hit them wrong and, you know, sound effects. Packed them in a Connex and took them to Mexico, and uh, we set up a training uh, situation, and then we later handed it off to the 71st Ordnance Group. After we'd gotten it done, you know, we, we had it working and everything. We handed it over to them. I'm not sure they're still doing it, but it was a, you know, it was a great time, man. I'd spend weeks in Mexico you know, observing training and uh, making sure the stuff was going, but it, it was a great gig. Yeah, I imagine that uh, the people down there were probably thankful too. We uh, worked directly with uh, Samara, Samana, Army, the Navy, the Federales. Uh, um, you know, it bomb techs from any other country are, are bomb techs. You yeah. know, they uh, they may not be trained to the same level, but you know. When you sit down with them, man, they're they're one of you. So yeah, you for know, sure. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we were up in uh, a city north of Mexico City, uh, their version of NTC, where we were doing this. You coming up to visit? Come on. Come on. <laughs> I love him. Get up there. He's just begging He's for attention. Old, man. There he goes. Oh. oh yeah, okay. Right. Hey, bud, come here. So, hey, come here. Uh, you know, it, it was a great time. And then uh, they pulled me up to be the chief of operations. Uh, there at the G at the G33, and that's what I did for uh, a good amount of time. A lot of time in Korea. He's being obstinate now. Yeah. So, um, you know, that really turned me on to Korea. I had not done uh, any time in Korea. Uh, showed up in Korea, 
and they dropped me off at Rodriguez Range right up on the DMZ, and we're right in the middle of UFG, and, uh, you know, that was two weeks of running as hard and fast as you could in place. <laughs> uh, you know, learning all about the Korea family of plans and understanding that there is no kidding a threat just to the north, and we were right up on the DMZ when we were there at Rod Range. Um, you know, you throw a rock and hit the DMZ. Mm. Uh, so that introduced me to Korea, and I would spend, you know, two or three weeks at a time, come home for a couple of months, go back. So a lot of time in Korea, um, and then ended up PCS into Korea to be the Deputy G34, uh, Deputy Protection Officer, the 8th Army EOD Officer. And, man, I, I had a great time there. I had a, a great team, guy named Captain Will Plummer, uh, Sergeant Major Johnny Strickland. Um, uh, yeah, Strickland sounds Strickland sounds familiar. Yeah, Strickland just retired out as the 71st CSM. Just a good group of, of, of guys, and, man, it, it was nice. They were there operating as the EOD control team, working with uh, the 18th EOD, or 718th EOD, uh, who's now part of the 23rd Chemical Battalion. Okay. Um, so, it, you know, you really learned a lot of operational stuff, what's going on in Korea, a lot of the history, uh, very real mission there. Um, so you support the mission, and um, well, I'm not even sure if you can say that, but I mean, you, you support what we're doing over there in Korea. What do you mean? Do, am uh, I in agreement with what's going on in Korea? Yes. Um, I, I think for me, um, the Koreans have learned a tremendous amount from us. It's up to them to you know take it to the next step. Mm -hmm. I personally, you know, I've, I've got a lot of time there. Went after I retired, I went back as a contractor. Um, as a counter WMD planner, uh, working directly for uh, USFK, uh, you know, with the the ROC Minister of National Defense, uh, Republic of Korea. Yeah, the Republic of Korea, um, the ROC JCS. Yeah. Um, but you know, they've learned a goodly amount. They've everybody. Everybody's always got a lot to learn. All right. Um, but I think that the value of us being there. Uh, we are a deterrent to oh, KJU, absolutely. plus um, it gives us a foothold. Yeah. Um, there's only 28,000 American service members on the ground in Korea at any one time, roughly. Um, so we're not going to take on North Korea and China by ourselves. It, it would be a rock uh, response uh, until our forces float on in, uh, according to the to the tip bid, the time phase force deployment plan, um, should something happen. But, you know, the Rocks uh, yeah. have got a strong defense there. Uh, so I, I think there is goodness there. Uh, I think Korea helps, uh, especially some of our senior leaders like me who had never been there. When you're put in the middle of it and you understand the operational perspectives and some of the, the national st strategic perspectives that are, are there, uh, I think it does teach you a lot about, um, you know, how we as a military function. And you learn, you know, w when we're in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, were we Iraqi and Afghan partners? Yeah, we were, but not to this level. Okay. Um, well, th this history goes back um, 60 years now. Yeah. Right? Maybe, yeah, yeah 60 years. So I, w I would say that— um, 70. Seventy years. Okay. Yeah. Oh so, my gosh. Yeah. Seventy years. One thinking. You know, um, my uncle fought in the Korean War. I had another uncle that was there during the axe murder incident. Um, things have changed. Uh, you know, back in the day, we really were there to be, you know, one of the, you know, one of the right hooks coming in after them. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, the Korea, the Korean defense has matured. Uh, they've got a healthy. Uh, they got a healthy force. Uh, they are able to be that first line of defense and buy time and wait for the coalition of nations to come in. Because, you know, there's there's a whole, within the combined forces command, uh, there are a lot of nations that participate. Uh, you know, Canadians, Brits, uh, I think Australian, the Danes, Australian, yeah, and, and you work with those guys right. and gals. So, um so on the experience level, sorry to <clears throat> cut you off, but on the experience level from a, um, how'd you put that? 
I don't want to say it's a training ground because that's not the right word I want to use. But well, everything's a training ground, but every so whenever you're stateside and you're running operations as as an officer, um, versus being put in that situation where you're having to actually sit there and work with other countries because people's lives depend on it, um, does that give you more of an edge when you come back uh, stateside to to the operation I, level? I, I think it gives you a greater depth of knowledge. Okay, um, you know, <clears throat> countries, every country has their own perspective. Uh, every military has their way of doing business. Um, you know, one of the things I was talking with one of my Korean partners about, and we were we were kind of struggling back and forth over over a concept. Um, and he's like, you know, j- sir, just because we do it a different way doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just different. Yeah. So having to work, you know, get past the language barrier in many cases. And many of those Koreans, they have great English. Yeah. Uh, you know, my first translator... Um, you know, again, I, I'd been in country two days and had never been there, and they introduced me to this Katusa, Korean augmentee to the U.S. Army, where they take Korean uh, soldiers and attach them to U.S. units. They wear U.S. uniforms. Okay. Um, Is that just to make us feel more, more at ease? <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's just this started back in the, in the, during the Korean War. Okay. Uh, when they realized that they needed, uh, we needed more people on the American team than we had. Mm-hmm. So they took Korean, you know, folks that they had compelled into service and said, you're going to do whatever needs to be done. So it traces, it. it's a long, proud heritage going back with those guys. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't know any of this. And so they're like, hey, we want to introduce you to, to Private Park. He's your translator. I'm like, so where did you learn to speak English? <laughs> and he looks at me and says, well, I... Attended uh, Johns Hopkins. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> undergraduate degree and then graduated with a, a degree in management information systems uh, from Duke University. I'm like, yeah, this cat is smarter than I am. <laughs> yeah, foot and mouth, right? Yeah, you know, so, um, you know, it's just a great. I think Korea, there's a, there's a lot to learn over there. You, you learn a lot about strategic policy, national policy. You learn how, you know, while two countries may be, you know, partnered up, um, you know, the big saying over there is kachi kachi da, we go together. Uh, well, just because you're going together doesn't mean you're not, like, yanking. It's like two two mules in the field. Right. When my dad was a kid, you know, my dad had to plow a, a field with mules. No way. Well, yeah. Well, the, the mules would get mad, so they're yoked in together, and they would jerk against each other right you know they're fighting they're still going forward but they're fighting each other so at the end they're a lot more tired and it took a lot more time <laughs> but they accomplished the mission but yeah but you know and that's kind of the way i look at it. you got two two countries that have their own policy their own goals their own objectives but yet they have one big common objective and that's to you know keep a guy in his box and make sure he doesn't do anything stupid um so yeah, I think there's a there's still a lot of value and worth being over there, and I, I learned a ton. You know, um, this in 2015, um, you know, tensions were getting hot, mm-hmm. and uh, two North Korean soldiers uh, dug underneath the the within the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, right at the dead center. You have what's called the MDL, the Military Demarcation Line. Well, there's checkpoints along that MDL, and these guys went underneath the fence. They planted um, three box mines, uh, Russian box mines, which even you, you, they're just almost impossible to find. You know, low metal content. Right. So these soldiers are going through a checkpoint, and a guy stepped on a landmine. His buddy went up to grab him, started pulling through, and then he stepped on. So both these guys lost their feet. Mm or at least one foot each. Um, so, you know, things got real tense real quick. Um, so you learn a, a lot about how things are handled at that strategic policy level. Um, you know, when you have to go and, uh, you know, Captain Plummer, I mentioned him before, um, he worked, he and Sergeant Major Strickland worked really close with the 718th, put together a team uh, to work with the United Nations Observers uh, to go up and conduct an investigation and figure out what's going on, uh, you know. So it uh, 
you learn a lot. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. And put my cigar out. <clears throat> my cigar is good. Thank you very much for that. So if you guys have any questions for us, uh, please drop in the uh, the comments. Um, let's uh, let's fast forward to <clears throat> excuse me, let's fast forward to uh, when you exited the military. You know that's uh, obviously one of the focuses for this uh, docu series is uh, uh, life uh, after you know service. So whenever you got out in 2018, correct? Yeah. Okay. No, 2019. 2019. So you um. You got out and moved back here to uh, Tennessee. I, I did. I had a guy that um, I grew up with. He, he started a very successful company uh, just south of the, the Georgia border here. Uh, I came in to work with him as, as one of his, as his operations guy. And for me, it was kind of a rough fit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and let me back up. You know, I told you I came out after my first tour. Um, you know, for me, that was difficult. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mentioned that I didn't feel like I was part of a team. Um, oh, at the, at the bank? Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> right. So, you know, I found myself not wanting to get out of bed some days. I just want to lay there and cover my head up. And, um, you know, I didn't know what was going on. Uh, but thankfully, I had a cousin who is a um, um, pharmacist. Hmm. And, man, he's like, you you got depression, dude. I'm like, what the hell's depression? <laughs> You know, I'm 27, 28 years old. <clears throat> I've got no idea what that is. Never right. heard of it. Right. And um, he's like, anybody that wants to go and, and lay in their bed all day and not get out on a nice sunny day and just lay there in a dark room with your head covered up, that's depression. Yeah. So he encouraged me to get into counseling, which I did. How hard was that mentally? Because you know, I mean, you're a hard charger. At yeah, that, but at that, point. at that point, I just felt I felt so bad. I just didn't care. I just wanted to feel better. Hmm. Um, and that first introduced me to depression. But that was a rough couple of years, and that's one of the reasons I wanted back in the army. I wanted to be, you know, wanted to be back on the green, big green, big green team. <laughs> right. Um, and that helped getting back. But you know, I learned a lot in those couple of years that I was out. Um, you know, the Army teaches you to be very self-sufficient, but at the same time, you got a whole team of, you know, 1.3 million other people that are right there. And then the veterans that support you that have already gone through the service, so you have like that, that connection. Yeah, but at that point, I didn't have any of that. You didn't? You okay. Know? And, you know, the, the, the Internet wasn't the way it oh, was yeah. today. You know, I, mean, I forget. Yeah, we're talking about the late you, 90s here. Yeah, I mean, you, you just didn't have that instant community. I couldn't go. There was no Facebook, and I know that's – hard for some people to see, <laughs> you know, there was no Reddit, there was nowhere that I could go, and, you know, I was back home in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I was sucking wind, and yeah. I had no idea what the hell was going on, um, but somehow I made it through, you know, I, I got in touch with the counselor and worked with her a little bit, started taking some meds, started feeling better, started to get my fire back, and realized, hey, I can get back in the army, there are things I can do, right, um, so, when I got back, you know, when, when I got pulled back in from the call to active, you know, the call to active duty, uh, you know, it felt good to put that uniform back and I was part of the team and, you know. Do you I remember ran, that day you put your uniform yeah. back on? Oh, man, I was happy as hell. And, <laughs> and, you know, then I ran hard for another 20 years. Yeah. Um, another 15, 20 years. <clears throat> so when I got out in 2019, uh, I knew what was coming or what could come. Okay. But I used that experience, you know, when I would have soldiers that wanted to get out, you know, I would say, hey, sit down with me, let's talk. I know that you got the pie, you know, a pie in your eye, and you're going to go out and you're going to do everything. You're going to be the new, you know, Jeff Bezos, and you're going to do all these great things. You're going to take this job at, you know. Microsoft or whatever. Microsoft or, or Walmart or whatever, and, and – you're going to be the next best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> you are getting out. You're leaving a team of people. You're leaving an organization and going into a whole different culture <clears throat> who doesn't give a damn. Yeah. It's almost like restarting from zero. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. that's exactly what it well, is. Well, it's it's, it's in, in many ways, it's like starting from less than zero. Because when you leave college or you leave high school – you know, you don't have that experience of being part of a team like the Army or the Navy or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
you know, an organization that's focused. Yeah. If, if you, that's interesting. If you, if you graduate college as Joe Civilian, you go through the inter- interview process, you go to work at XYZ Corporation, and that's the corporate culture, well, that's normal. Right. You know, that's, well, this is what they all told me you're about. You're also in your peer group. Yeah, you're in your peer group. Yep. Whereas you come out after, you know, five, six, ten years in the military, and, you know, you're used to things being done a certain way. You're used to people being very directive in nature. You're used to being things being very structured. 90% of the time you don't have to read between the lines. What is Sergeant, <laughs> you know, what is Sergeant Stiegel saying? Right. You know, um, There's usually no having to guess that in the military. Right. So, you know, I would spend a lot of time with, with – my soldiers and officers getting out, you got to know that this is coming. You've right. got to have a plan. And when I got out, you know, the first time, man, we were in debt. I didn't think anything about it. You know, I was living the, the credit card lifestyle. Hey, we're going to go here. We're going to go here. Um, so I would really focus on trying to encourage uh, my soldiers, have your debt under control. Yep. Understand that mentally – Things are going to change. You don't think they will, but they will. Do you think that some? Of the, I mean, I'm I'm sure that I know people because my, my situation on, out of the military was not by not by choice. But I've uh, heard about the, the the talk that officers give soldiers, and I think a lot of soldiers may misconstrue that talk as a as a talk to keep them in the military. Whereas, yes, for, and, and and some of them do. From, but from what you're saying, your approach was you are getting out. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. be prepared for X, Y, Z. And I think that that's something that, you know, anybody who's watching this who is active, make sure that, you know, you don't know what that officer is going to talk to you about or that, you know, senior NCO. So give them a chance because, as Jay is saying here, there's a lot of information that you may not have thought, thought about yeah. beforehand, and that's their job. You're still under their your care, well, right? Well, in you my know? case, I actually cared. Yeah, you know, and there's and I believe that you know there's bad leaders out there. And there's bad there's bad soldiers. There's bad followers too. <laughs> um, but you know, um, you know, I just remember what I went through, and when I was enlisted, I had a great, you know, I had some great NCOs that really, you know, Sergeant First Class um, Pat was here. I mean, she she really taught me a lot of how to be a soldier. You mm-hmm. know, again, a strong E seven. Right. Hey, come here, yep. knucklehead. <laughs> hey, PFC land, come here. You're, right. you're messing up here. Um, so to me, that's really, you know, we were talking about UCMJ earlier. I always looked at UCMJ. Um, you know, in my battalion command time, I had to give out UCMJ, but I always tried to use it as a chance to shape and fix and steer, not a chance just to lower the boom on somebody. Right. Um. And to me, you know, nowadays there's, you know, I'm sure it's been this way through the ages. There's a lot of uh, NCOs and officers that feel, you know, I got this power and this dude's being a knucklehead. I'm just going to crush him. Well, why, why is that person being a knucklehead? Right. But then you also have to realize that, you know, when this person has made the, the decision to get out, that's an impactful decision. Mm-hmm. You got to respect it. And then you got to do what you can to try and set them up for success. And help them understand that stuff's about to change. Right. You know, their world's getting ready to take another big twist, and they may not be ready for it. Yep. And, you know, I over the years, I, they they diagnosed me with PTSD and all this, this craziness, anxiety. And I, I took full advantage of behavioral health. Hmm. And I made no bones about it. Would you suggest that for other? Oh, I, I absolutely. absolutely, and I did. You know, I I would tell you know anytime I had a chance to talk with soldiers who were worried about their clearance or worried about this. Hey, look, you're looking at a guy that's been clinically diagnosed with PTSD from the, some of the stuff I did in Iraq over three and a half years. Um, they didn't pull my security clearance. Right. They didn't make me go work at the MWR. They didn't. <laughs> you know, they didn't sideline me. You know, I made battalion command. Yeah. I made Brigade S3. I, I made XO to a commanding general. You know, if, if I can do that, you can too, but you got to understand your behavioral health is just as imp- if, you know, if, if you cut your foot really bad down to the bone, you're not going to shove your 
foot back in the boot and just keep <laughs> you're you're gonna go you know if your toes almost covered you're gonna go fix it yeah fix it right same way with behavioral health and and i think that that's the message that many of our leaders at all levels and you're starting to see you're starting to see a lot more general officers talk about behavioral health good yeah um and they need to yeah um you know it's it's important that our young young soldiers and our young officers understand that behavioral health uh, is part of life and you have to do what you can do to take care of that so so when I hear you say that um, you know you know I also often hear as, as you've heard I'm sure on Facebook a lot before you know veteran suicide awareness or you know mental health awareness where everyone's fucking aware there's not a single person who isn't aware so I think what we have to do now is almost give <clears throat> excuse me give examples of how that fits into somebody's life. So, for instance, for you, like, you sharing your story, like, whenever you think of behavioral health, like, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, do you still do you still go see behavioral health? I like, do. once? Okay. So, you know, I was just there last week. Okay. You know, one of, the, <clears throat> one of the first things I did when I got back from Korea this time, you know, last month or June, you know, called the VA. Hmm. You know, I established... You know, when I was home the first time, right after I'd gotten out, uh, you know, I established, you know, because I knew that I knew, when I was in Iraq the last time, um, you know, I went without. I'd left the war college, and at the war college, I went through 15 months of focused, you know, I, I was going through a divorce, mm. and uh, so I called, uh, you know, you go through orientation and then processing, and we had this uh, Navy 06 get up and talk about, um, you know, family life, family health, behavioral health, and all that. Uh, I was, at that time, trying to save my marriage. Uh, so I called this guy. I'm like, hey, sir, I need to talk to you. Here's a little bit about me. He's like, look, come tomorrow. He goes, uh, what kind of sandwich do you like? Oh, I'll eat anything. He goes, well, come tomorrow. Here's my office. We're going to have lunch. Really? Yeah. Uh, and it turns out this guy had been, I think, Clinton's physician. So, um, you know, I showed up and we talked and, you know, at the end of the talk, he's like, look, man, you, you got two choices, Major. And again, this is like the first or second week that I'm there. He said, you can either uh, call combat health from my phone right here or I'll put you in my car and take you over there. Well, okay, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there's no real choice there. So, right. um, so for 15 months, um, I'll go to... Uh, behavioral health points appointments once or twice a week I had two two caregivers one was this mean old crusty retired <laughs> female 06 Navy type and another one was just this sweet you know like your most favorite aunt <laughs> okay um, so the mean crusty 06 would tell me how much of an asshole I was being and <laughs> <laughs> how screwed up I was acting, and and just call me the car, you know, call me on the carpet for everything. Yeah. And then the other one would be patting me on my back, so they were tag teaming. Yeah. So it sounds, for, sounds like a healthy approach from yeah. a from an overview standpoint. And they started breaking stuff down and making me, you know, think of things I'd seen and and been part of in Iraq and other places. Um. So I left there on really good footing, and then right back into you know, uh, Iraq, working on the U.S. Forces Iraq staff. Right. Um, with, a, a you know, three staffs all pulled together under me, and then uh, my work with State Department. And after about a month, six weeks, my Sergeant Major and I was talking, and uh, I'm like, this just didn't work, and so I went to behavioral health. Hmm. So every Wednesday, you know, I'd get in my little vehicle, drive from my office over to Sather Army Airfield, and meet with my behavioral health provider the entire time I was there. Thanks for sharing that. That's really personal. So um, thank you. Yeah, but you know, I think it's important because people need to know that. You know, our soldiers, I never would have guessed that. Our, well, it's because they they've set me up for success, and to me, there's no shame in talking about it. You know, if you come down, you know, with if you come down with prostate cancer, you can't help that. Uh, you're going to go get treated, and then you're going right. to tell all your buddies, hey, man, you better go, hey, you'll go, you'll better go, go check. get checked. Yeah. Same thing with behavioral health. Well, so for me, like, whatever I think of behavioral health, and, and this is 
you know, I, I'm really glad that I'm doing this just for my own health. Um, so in my mind, I was thinking that you go see behavioral health for like three months, six months, or, or however long, but it's only like a set period. But what you're, you're telling me is it's something that you've been regularly yeah. uh, adjusting to and yeah. going as needed. Um, it's really helped you out. Yeah, I mean, you got to get to know yourself. Um, you, yeah. you know, it really started for me my second tour in Iraq when I was the Brigade 3, and, man, I just quit sleeping. And I was constantly, I mean, I would rip people apart just for the little stupid stuff. <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm just not sleeping. I'm getting like two hours of sleep a night. Yeah. Right? And you can't fight, you know. As a Brigade 3, you, you can't function on three, four night hours. So, yeah. um, you can't function as a soldier with yeah. three, four hours of sleep. Right? So, to me, it, it's important. Um, and I had, a, I had a segue there where I was going. But, yeah, you know, I... Yeah, I, I, even my last tour in Iraq, I was doing behavioral health. Mm-hmm. And then when I got back, um, where did I go when I came back? After Iraq, the third, that's when I went to the 20th right. and established behavioral health there. Went there periodically. Right. And it, it's it's just continually peeling layers off the onion. Hmm. Um, so, that's really, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I never would have thought that um, going periodically – sustainable in a, in a sustained way may be more beneficial oh it's absolutely more beneficial because you're constantly changing you're constantly growing you're constantly absolutely figuring out yeah. you know what works what doesn't yeah and so, life changes as you get older you yeah. change i mean my hairs are falling out change I, you know yeah, I, mean, I don't want to hear that okay. <laughs> until until you're like this i don't want to hear that mess well let's let's talk about let's segue into this um i do know one thing that's really important is is uh finding your passions yeah, you, you got to find something you want to do. Um, yeah, I came back to work for my buddy. It didn't work out. One of my old bosses, a retired general officer, he works for a major defense contractor. He's like, hey, man, I need you in Korea. So I found my way back into Korea. <laughs> um, Round two. Yeah, so, you know, I, I spent the last two years in Korea working as a, a WMD planner uh, at USFK, you know, Front line working with the rock staffs, M and D, uh, JCS, and again, um, you know, they didn't make me quit doing that because I went to behavioral health. Right. You know, I'm sitting. If anything, I, I if I was in charge, which you know, please don't let that happen. But if I was in charge and I had a soldier or or a leader who was checking himself, I would feel more confident. And his capabilities and him knowing that, you know, if for whatever reason I gave him a task that, hey, man, like right now I can't handle that, I'd feel more comfortable giving him more information and more responsibilities. Yeah. Well, you know, and if you're open with your leaders, you know, the first time I was in Korea assigned, um, there was a, a fellow 05, worked down the hall. Um, you know, my boss and I talked about everything. Well, my boss and this guy's boss were talking, and... Um, they were talking about that officer, and uh, you know, my colonel's like, "Hey, look, man, I got a an O5 over here. He's been going to behavioral health for years. He is very vocal about. It. He just doesn't give a damn." <laughs> he goes, "We need to get them together." Hmm. So they came to me and they're like, "Hey, look, we're concerned with this dude. He won't talk to anybody. Can you develop that relationship?" So I went down and started developing a relationship. I mean, we kind of knew each other. We got to talking. And then finally, you know, a few days later, I just, I, I called him out on it. Hmm. He went to behavioral health. You know, he'd been avoiding it, but he didn't realize the way his actions were showing. He didn't realize the outputs that were coming on and the, the signals that he was giving. I wonder if it's because you're so tunnel visioned on what's on your emotions and well, what's going on. it's not only that, but, you know, you don't want to be the stigma of a lieutenant colonel going to behavioral health. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. And that was like one of his big sticking points. Mm-hmm. And me as a fellow of five, I was able to... Oh, you look at me. Yeah. Same, same. Off. Right. Um, so that that's why I think it's so important. And then even when you're out, you know, when um, uh, as a retiree, you don't get, you know, as a retiree outside the States, you're kind of at the whims of wherever you're at. Right. And, um, you know, I was for the first... Eight months, I was at Camp Humphreys. Uh, they didn't have the hospital up and totally running. They had very limited behavioral health stuff, and they were just overwhelmed by all the active duty dudes and dudettes <laughs> that were there. 
so it wasn't really um, conducive. conducive. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but, you know, I kind of maintained it. I'd come home for a visit every few months. I'd go to the VA. Yep. Because I could just walk in. So I already had that, you know, already had my foot in that door, and I could I could adjust meds and all that and then get a shit ton of meds <laughs> and go back. And be good for yeah. whatever, three months or four months. Whatever. Yeah. And then uh, so as soon as I redeployed for good, you know, last month, um, you know, that was one of the first calls I made. You know, hey, doc, I want to get in, touch base, make sure that, you know, we're still good to go. Um, but I've also found just talking, you know, sharing a story, um, it, it's helpful. It, it's yeah. like I've, I've told a lot of soldiers it's like uh, uh, a cavity or an abscessed tooth. Okay. Um, that damn tooth hurts, but nobody can see your teeth, right? <laughs> And it's painful as hell, and you're trying to grin and bear it, but you're hurting constantly. Yeah. So what do they do? You go to the doctor. Well, the doctor opens it, opens you up, and then they start digging in. And they're scraping that shit, that crap, out of the middle of your tooth. Yeah. And you can't feel it because you're all numbed up, but you, you, you feel the, uh, on you know, you know they're digging. Yep. <laughs> and, and it's painful, and they're digging, and, you know, you might have to get a root canal, and that's painful. But two or three weeks later, after they've dug all the crap out, feel better. You're fixed. Yeah. To a point. But and then, you then you still, still have to go about the checkups. You still got to clean. Yeah, it. you still got to brush your teeth. So you yep. still got to go see the doc. Yep. Um, hmm. And that's what I think people. It, it breaks my heart to hear, you know, the suicides. Yeah. Um, I had a very personal, you know, one of my good buddies growing up. He uh, he killed himself. Nobody saw it coming. And, um, you know, we, we've actually got a scholarship fund established here that we maintain in his name. Mm. You know, I would share that with, with my soldiers. You know, i got a good buddy here that just put a 357 in his mouth and went away. Well, guess what? His mother has never been the same. I mean, to this day, this, you know, 30 years ago, yeah. you know, his parents ended up getting a divorce. Uh, his sister has issues. So, suicide is a very permanent solution to a temporary problem. Yeah. And what they did, you know, they kind of went and looked through a lot of things. They they since determined that he got teased a lot in school. Um, he was always a little bit different from everybody else. But we all we're, we're all different. different in our own way. Right. But they had him on acne meds, and they think that the acne meds that he was on was it Accutane? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, they, they they think that the the, uh, the the meds messed with him. Yeah, I mean I know when when I was a teenager, I had a uh, was on Accutane and it messed with my hormones and my chemical imbalance a yeah. lot. Yeah, like a whole lot. And that's you know, but you know I always tried to stress that to my soldiers. You know, suicide personally affects everyone. And you know it affects. Your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your wife, your daughter, your husband, um, more than you could ever understand and realize, and it continues. I heard a, uh, a really disturbing fact. It's um, if somebody commits suicide, then the the children of the person have like a 140 percent chance higher. Of, I've heard that. Uh, I think it's something outrageous. Yeah. And um, and it's really. You know, at some point, you know, we have to own our own, own our own shit. And yeah. you know, I've I've been in dark places plenty of times in my life, and several times in the past few years, especially with 2020. I think we all have. Yeah. Um, and it's one of those things where I've learned that my therapy is talking with people yeah. like you, and just talking through this stuff. And, and it's not always the easiest thing to do, but it's it's often afterwards you're like, whew, like that. Yeah. Well, the load's off. Loads off. Yeah, like, you, you scrape, that shit you off. scrape the shit out of your... <clears throat> you know, and, and another thing, too, that, that people don't realize is there's a lot of chemicals that play in discussing behavioral health because stress, you know, I'm no doctor, uh, and I did not stay at the Holiday Inn last <laughs> night. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, you know, when you're going through stresses, it alters the chemical pathways within your brain. Yeah, definitely does. So when you're going through stuff and these chemical grooves are being imprinted in your head 
and then you change circumstance to maybe a less stressful. You go from jumping out of airplanes and shooting guns or running EOD incidents, you know, you spend a year in Iraq running up and down Route, route Irish taking out IEDs, you know, and you got guys that are, you know, on guard watching over you and snipers trying to take you out. Um, uh, you know, you know, you see your buddies blown up. Well, you go through a year of that and those chemicals are just burning past in your brain. And then you come back to, you know, Fort Leavenworth and now all of a sudden, you know, you're the training guy in your company where downrange you're going a, a billion miles an hour with responsibility and with pressure and with danger it's, it's just been yeah so it's almost like the 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 vehicle doesn't match the roadways right now all of a sudden now all of a sudden you're responsible for planning you know ranges you're you're the the s3 ops officer at the battalion and uh, you got to plan rifle range days. You got to plan a ruck march, or or you get out, and now yeah. you're you're having a whole different responsibility at right. a corporate job or something. So now all of a sudden, those chemicals are just, you know, the old my mom used to say, and I bet your mom did too. The idle mind is the devil's workshop. Yeah. Well, really, the idle mind is a chemical workshop because you're going from being the guy or the gal that's there on the point end of the spear doing all this stuff, and now you're planning. Oh, we got a range here, uh, ruck march here. Oh, we're gonna have the the ACFT, APFT, whatever they call or it. Or Friday's it. casual Friday. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and all of a sudden, your chemicals are just going friggin' haywire. Well, if 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 you don't go get that addressed through behavioral health and fight those chemicals with the right chemicals and therapy, because both of, you got to have both of them, I think. Mm-hmm. Those chemicals are just going to keep running around trying to find stuff to do. Back to your analogy earlier, you're running. You're running with a, a broken foot. Yeah, a cut foot. Yeah. yeah, you're getting nowhere fast, and you're going to get gangrene of the mind. Right, gangrene of the mind. Did you make yeah. that up? Yeah, I, I just saw that. Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Literally, just gangrene just of the mind. Just right then. That's pretty good. Gangrene um, of the mind. Well, let's um. I know we've been that's, going for about some heavy stuff, man. That is. We're, we're, let's uh, dive just a little bit more into this. Let's go parallel to it. Um, and we talked about passions earlier. I think uh, for me, my passions are are flying, my drone, and doing this podcast uh, stuff. Uh, guilty of playing Warzone. I do like occasional video game. Uh, and you know, my dog Baxter, of course. And yeah, your yeah, yours is me. Oh, that sounded funny, dude. <laughs> You you love cooking Mine, meats. Mine is food. You, you're, oh, me. Okay, food. Okay, okay. Well, I, I got to say, like, I've never... Uh, so today I, I got the chance to, to watch you uh, in action, and I've never seen uh, someone so passionate about uh, butchery. I didn't know how much of an art skill it is and how much actual uh, thought process goes into refining uh, the quality meats. And I probably had the best steak of my life today, um, thanks to you and, uh, and what you're doing. So dive into, like, why... You know, this is your passion, and, and why you think that's good for you, and is it therapeutic for you? Well, I've I've always been, you know, since a younger age, kind of interested in cooking. I didn't realize how much. Um, my grandmother first introduced me to all kinds of different food. You know, growing up here in Chattanooga, you know, you got your oh, gosh. your roast beef, your mashed potatoes, you know, fried Close chicken. Law. You know. And good, I love good Southern food, but my grandmother would take me to an Indian restaurant, and there weren't that many around. She'd take me to a Chinese restaurant. So I developed kind of an interest. I love food. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a good thing about being in Korea. I mean, you can eat anything in Korea. Um, so my next influence was my uncle. I had an uncle down in the uh, New Orleans, Louisiana area, and, you know, I spent a lot of time down there. And he would teach me how to cook. Was he Cajun by chance? Yeah, no, he, yeah he was Cajun. Um, Those are the best cooks, by the way. Yeah, I mean, he, he really taught me a lot. And we would sit down, you know, they had a, a house on stilts. Oh, awesome. Um, so we'd sit down. He lived right there on, on on the canal in the bayou. And we'd watch Justin Wilson, that old Cajun cook. And we'd sit there and drink beer and watch this guy. And <laughs> um, I bet those really fun memories. Yeah, I mean, it was a great time. You know, one neighbor, 
was a crabber. Neighbor two doors down was a shrimper. Oh, good grief. Dude. So on Saturdays, wow. you know, we would go buy a big bag of crawfish and so the the crawfish, come, shrimp, and crab. Yeah, so four or five of the neighbors, we'd all get together and we'd boil cra- crabs and crawfish and shrimp and then the sausage, the potatoes, the carrots, oh the my gosh, corn. Yeah. You're making me hungry. Okay, we, we get the picture. So, um, <laughs> you know, awesome. it really gave me a. a you know, interest in cooking, and then you fast forward. So I'm in Korea, 2015 to 2018. One of my best friends there uh, that I made uh, was a Korean American, born in Korea. They moved over to Birmingham, Alabama, when he was two or three. Raised in the states, ended up back in Korea. Didn't have any good American barbecue, so he started doing his own. Hmm. And then he started doing pop-ups at his friend's restaurants. Well, now he's got a, a really big restaurant there serving, you know, true American barbecue brisket, you know, pork butt, um, pulled pork, all the great American barbecue staples. And the Koreans, they love it. And the expats, they love it for sure. It's a taste of home. Hmm. Um, so, you know, we developed a really close relationship, really close friendship. And um, so I started helping him come up with ideas for his menu. So we started making sausages to put on his menu, Texas hot gut style, and uh, the mama's home. So, um, you know, that really got me interested. So I started doing charcuterie on the side kind of as a, as a home hobby. Um, about 18 months ago, I ran into uh, Chris Bilbra. He owns Spec. And this guy just really cares about food, uh, fresh local food um, that is done right. Um, so, you know, he's given me the opportunity to learn, and and uh, he's teaching me butchery, he's teaching me sausage making, charcuterie. Um, this last time in Korea, I linked up with a guy who's from the Netherlands. He owns a deli in, oh, wow. in Korea. So I'd spend weekends with him, nights and weekends, making all kinds of different, you know, European sausages. Wow. Um, so it really, you know, it was a hobby, but it's it's a good hobby because I eat very, very well. Yeah. And it's healthy, too. Like, we had we had steak, squash, and zucchini yeah. for lunch. And it's yeah. it was really delicious. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, that kind of goes into more of the mental health. Like, if you eat right, if you yeah. eat good, uh, you'll feel better. And yeah, so it sounds like you absolutely. kind of have like a trifecta. So you're, you're liking what you're doing, you're eating better, and you're probably saving a little bit of money too. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I put in sweat equity. You know, I still sweat got equity. my new job. You know, I'm, I'm still with, with the defense contractor and, uh, you know, doing some neat stuff with those guys. Uh, but I got something to do in the evenings and on the weekends. It, it's, it. a, it's a great opportunity, and, you know, I'm just thankful. Um, you know, this guy really cares. He's an executive chef. Right. And he really cares, one, about – good food done right we source everything local yeah which i love i think it's within 150 miles 150 miles um we bring in whole sides of beef whole sides of pork you know it's butchered out um you know his daughter uh she has turned into a heck of a butcher oh yeah she's awesome she's great yeah she's great she's you know to be in her early 20s man she just she knows she knows flavors she knows food she knows how to prep and just really put a good product out. So it's really nice. You know, people come in, and, and you see people starting to come back, and more and more, hey, do you have any of the bratwurst? Yeah. Hey, any Italian sausage today? Because we always rotate. <laughs> um, you know, so it's just great food done at a, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a way that is, is good for the community uh, and is good for the person. So oh, I like it. Yeah. Well, what um, I guess as we sign off here, what what uh, what'd be a message that you have for the EOD community? You know, one, just take care of each other. You know, we've got to, as a community, take care of each other. Yeah. You know, EOD is is, you know, we we've, we've come to prominence that we've never had before. You know, they're starting to put EOD officers and NCOs on major command staffs. Yes. You know, I was on the uh, the Arctic staff and by default the Tradoc staff, uh, to where you know all things EOD, those commanders would look at at me. Hey, what you know? What is this? Yep. Um, 
so now EOD is prominent, and EOD matters. It's always mattered, but commanders didn't realize how much. Yeah. But we've got to take care of our own. You know, we need we need strong NCOs and strong officers that will teach the junior officers and the junior NCOs and the soldiers how to take care of themselves and to reach out and be part of a community. Uh, we need to do more to make sure that we – help our soldiers, uh, our sailors, airmen, marines, coasties, and I guess guardians now. I'm not, <laughs> sh- I'm not sure they're going to have EOD in the Space Force. You hey, know. you never know. You never know. Um, but, you know, soldiers matter. And yeah. it, I trace it back to that one NCO when I was a young PFC, starting first class Legier, that, um, you know, she taught me, you know, the reins of being a soldier. And, you know, we need... We need those E7s <clears throat> taking those lieutenants uh, and teaching those lieutenants how to be lieutenants. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need, you know, our company grade officers teaching those lieutenants how to be lieutenants. Uh, we need our NCOs teaching our junior NCOs how to lead those privates um, and how to, you know, love and you, you got to love your soldiers. That's, you know, one big thing we always had, um, you know, the, the Korean system is different. Uh, the Koreans uh, don't necessarily like command. They look <laughs> at it as babysitting. Okay. And, you know, it. so we, we had a, a, a major that was getting promoted to lieutenant colonel and getting ready to go take command of a battalion. And the Rocco 6, he's like, hey, Jay, he goes, you know, talk to Major Lee. He goes, what's, and there were several of them there. What is the biggest thing about being a battalion commander? What's your number one piece of advice? Mm-hmm. I'm like, love your soldiers. Love your NCOs. Love your soldiers like you love your kids. And and take care of them. And well, to, to them, that was, what? Yeah. <laughs> because they're compelled. You right. Know, those folks come in. They do, you know, they're constricted, cons- conscripted. They might stay on and b- stay with the military, but most of them are a couple of years and gone. And they all kind of looked at me funny. Hmm. And then a minute later, um, our 05 came in, the American 05 came in. And, um, hey, Colonel Cruz, what's, you know, we're talking about Major Lee becoming a battalion commander. What's the most important thing for Major Lee? Without blinking, he's like, take care of your soldiers. Love Absolutely. your soldiers, blah, blah, blah. And, and they just look and they're like, Colonel Cruz is like, did I say something funny? He said, no, you, you said <laughs> the exact same bad. thing Mr. Land said. Um, so, you know, our leaders should not look at command or leadership positions as babysitting. Right. They're taking care of America's sons and daughters. Well, I'm going to uh, say thank you for yeah, that. man. Um, a blast. I, I've had a, I've had a great time, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna also say uh, I think that uh, as a soldier or a previous soldier, um, I think it'd be great uh, after talking to over 100 EOD techs this past uh, few I guess nearly a month now. Um, it has occurred to me that uh, some leaders who are good leaders haven't really been given the proper credit. So I want to say yeah. thank you uh, for you stepping up to the plate Man, and, and really being the I'm just the, a product. For, yeah, some some of the guys that knew me when I was a young lieutenant, young, <laughs> young captain. Uh, you know, Sergeant Major Pollagus is out there probably watching. He'll tell you. <laughs> he'll tell you some great stories. Um, well, th- well, thank you though, Jay. You it, it's it's really great for you to step up to the plate and, and do this, and that's that's what a good leader does. And so, thank you for I'm first, man. I'm the first one to sit down. But, you know, thank you for doing this. I, I think we anything that we can do to make our community more aware of the Bring dangers us together. of, you know, not taking care of our peeps. Yep. Uh, so thank you for coming up with this great idea and then following it through. Yes, sir. Always. Well, guys, let us know what you think about this uh, first episode. Uh, this has been a rough draft, but it's actually been uh, way more uh, successful than I thought it was going to be. And uh, thank you, Jay, for hosting me here. And you guys, be sure to send in your comments, questions. Uh, let me know uh, if anybody else wants to sign up for this. Just shoot me an email. Uh, we're going to do a Patreon page for these. We'll probably have one, maybe two episodes a week. And in uh, two weeks, I fly out to Denver to interview the oldest 
EOD Tech live. He's a 98 year old World War II EOD Tech, uh, Mr. Jerry Simons. So, from that, we'll sign off and thank you guys very much for watching. Hey, thanks a lot. Have a great evening. <laughs>